Shalom, and welcome to Via Hafta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. There is nothing more important than the gospel. Without the gospel, you have no hope. You have assurance of eternal judgment and condemnation. But with the gospel, all of that can be different. You can find God's grace, His mercy, that extends to you eternal forgiveness so that you can have that eternal relationship with God for eternity in His kingdom. There is no message better than the gospel. And you can learn a great deal about the gospel truth from the book of Psalms and Psalm 24. Take out your Bible and look there with me. The book of Psalms and Psalm 24. Now, once again, we see that this psalm was written by David, that is King David. And he reveals in this psalm, a rather short one, some very important principles that are related to our understanding what the New Covenant writes concerning the gospel message. So let's begin Psalm 24, beginning in verse 1. A psalm of David, literally it says, to David, a psalm, meaning it's by him. To the Lord is the earth and its fullness. So the first thing that, that David wants to reveal to the reader, that is you and me, that God is sovereign. He is over all of his creation. He is the one that everything belongs to. So he is authority and the proper way, and we see that here, for him to be understood is as the Lord. Here's the key, the one and only Lord. He controls all things, including your eternity. So once more, to the Lord is the earth and its fullness. And then he uses a different word, a synonym for the earth, but it's broader than that. It is the word tevel, which is the entire world and the inhabitants in it, in the world. So this psalm tells us that God is speaking in regard to creation, both the physical creation and also those who dwell in this world. This psalm has no one that is excluded. Read on. Notice what he says in verse 2. He says here, For he, upon the waters, he has established it. And upon the rivers, he has, once more, a different word for establishing it, having prepared it properly for the purpose of longevity, enduring. So God, everything belongs to him, and he created it. This speaks not just of his lordship, his authority, but his ability. If he's able to create all things, maintaining it, establishing it, therefore there is nothing that God cannot do. All things, in other words, are possible with him. Verse 3. Now, with that in mind, the greatness of God, the power of God, the authority of God, notice there's a question that is posed to you and me, the reader. Who will go up to the mountain of the Lord? And who will stand in his holy place? Now, notice what we see here when we look at this verse we see that, that the mountain of the Lord is a holy place. Therefore, who's able to be part of God's presence? 
It is a reference to, when we see his holy mountain, we see clearly a reference to his kingdom. Who can experience this intimacy with God? And he answers in the next verse. Verse 4, when he says, Naki chapayim uvar levav. The one who has clean hands and a pure heart. Now, ask yourself, does that describe you? Do you have perfectly, and here's the key, do you have perfectly clean hands and a pure heart? That there is no filth, no dirt, nothing that's improper. And when it talks about clean hands, it's a reference to deeds, that you have deeds that are perfect without sin. And your heart thoughts, Maybe, and this is simply to illustrate, maybe there's someone who has never done anything wrong. Now, there's not, other than Yeshua himself. But let's say there was. But what about his thoughts? Does he always have a pure heart that is pure thoughts? See, we are going to be judged, and this tells us this, we're going to be judged not just for what we've done, but also for our thoughts. What we desire within. So who is going to go up on the mountain of the Lord? Who is going to stand in his holy place? Here's the answer. One who has clean hands and a pure heart. Who does not lift up in vain. Does not lift up, meaning he does not speak of of vanity. And when it says he, it speaks about the inner being, his soul. Literally, it's my soul does not take up my soul, meaning my name does not make an oath in vanity. And does not, look at the end of verse 4, and who does not swear in deceit, in, in that which is not true. So the question is, not only does he judge our deeds, our thoughts, and now, our words, our speech reveals a great deal about our spiritual condition. So here, when we look at all those different aspects of a human being, what do we find? We find that we're in trouble because our thoughts are not always pure, our words are not always honest, and our deeds are not always proper. He says in verse 5, The one who is this, what does he receive? He takes up a blessing from the Lord. Now, my hope is that we want to be those things. And this is a very important part of the gospel message. Now, we know that no one is righteous, no, not one. And of course, the exception is Yeshua. But of humanity, born in a natural way conceived in a natural way. No one is righteous. No, not one. The scripture says, we all have fallen short of the glory of God. So the question is, this is our reality, but is it what we want? Do we want to be people that speak falsely, that that take an oath in deceit and practice things that, that are not clean before God? Here's a biblical truth. A candidate for salvation, he wants to leave those things. He wants to have pure hands, a clean heart, and speech that is rooted in honesty. That's the one that God is willing to save, that he is going to move in that person's life. But if we don't want to live righteously, if we want to just continue in sin, but not be judged for a sin, that is not a candidate for salvation. We need to, and the concept is repentance. A true candidate for salvation wants to and does repent. He wants to turn from his or her sin. He does not want to live in disobedience to God. He does not want to sin. His motivation for coming to faith is to be turned away from sin. 
So such a one, what is he seeking? He's seeking a blessing from the Lord. And notice, and righteousness from the God of his salvation. That can also be translated his Savior. And the word righteousness, what's really interesting is that this word, tzedakah, in, in Hebrew, this word, tzedakah, speaks of righteousness. But here's what we need to realize. It is righteousness that is achieved by the grace of God. In fact, when I was preparing for this, I was going through different reference materials. And when we look, we find that although this word righteous is, is written here, this word utztaka, what we find is underneath in the helps, it has the word chesed. Why? This is what Judaism says. There is no righteousness without the grace of God. And I think that's so significant. And we see here a relationship between God's grace that produces righteousness and that is manifested by means of salvation. So here's another very important part of the puzzle. And that is that God is gracious, God saves, and he does so by his grace for the purpose of those who want to live in righteousness. Now, we are not justified by our righteous deeds. We are justified by the grace of God through the work of Messiah, the shedding of his blood. But in order for that to be appropriated to us, we need to desire righteousness. If we desire to live in sin, that salvation isn't going to be offered to us. Salvation is offered to those who want. Now, we can't change in and of ourselves. It's only the Holy Spirit working in us by the grace of God, by the indwelling of that Holy Spirit in the life of the believer that produces actual repentance, the fruit of repentance, the will of God, the righteousness of God. But if we don't desire that, we're not a candidate for salvation. So he says, such a person, he is going to take up blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Look at the next verse, verse 6. This is the generation. Now, some have said this defines a kingdom generation. And we can understand that as those who are going to be part of the kingdom experience. So this is the generation that seeks him. Here's the key. A kingdom generation is the one that seeks him, that seeks God. That's the motivation. I want to experience him. What is this a reference to? What we already talked about earlier. That one wants to ascend to that holy mountain. This one wants to experience the holiness of God. That's his motivation. That's why it causes him. That's what causes him to say yes to the gospel. He is pursuing God. So this is the generation who seeks him, who seeks, notice this, who seeks your face, O Jacob, Selah. Now, I want to talk about this verse for a few minutes because many times people add certain things in the text. It would be wise for you to, to compare different translations. And when you look at many translations, some add the God of Jacob. It's not in the text. It's just Jacob. It's not referring to the God of Jacob, but Jacob himself. And some, like the New American Standard, it puts the word even, even Jacob, meaning this wretched one, even Jacob. This is not what the text says. It does not have that word. What it says is, this is the generation that seeks him. And the last part of this tells us, those who seek your face, that's an idiom for intimacy. Those who want to be intimate, to be in the presence of God, to experience him. And then it says, Jacob, 
This was Jacob. He is the example, the biblical example. That's why he was wrestling in that womb, because he wanted the privilege of being the firstborn. Why? Having the heritage of his fathers, of Yitzchak and Avraham, being that instrument of the Abrahamic covenant. And what's that covenant? To be a blessing. That in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's what Jacob sought. That's what he was after. And this is what the scripture is referring to us. The Jacob character. Not a deceiver, but one who was passionate about the purposes of God. Verse 7. Lift up your heads, O gates. So the gates in the entrance or the image here is the gates into the kingdom of heaven. Lift up, O, o gates, your heads. And the openings, the entrance of, of these gates will be lifted up. And notice that they are, and the word here is eternal gates. And here again, this word olam, eternal, is simply a, a adjective that describes the kingdom. So the kingdom, olam, has to do with the eternity eternity and not just the eternity but the quality of that eternal what it's about so the gates are an entrance into this place so he says lift up O gates your heads and be lifted up the eternal uh, entrances verse verse 7 last part and the king of glory comes who is the king of glory? Verse, verse 8. The Lord, the one who's strong and mighty, the Lord who is mighty in war. So God here is speaking about going to war. He's mighty. And we use this word for strength and power and might. When you look at this verse, notice that it has in verse 8, in regard to the Lord, that he is powerful that he's mighty and then that same word for mighty is used in the second part for war there's a battle and that battle is for the soul of the individual verse 9 very similar to what we just read lift up O gates your head and be lifted up the eternal entrances and then it says the king of glory he will enter Verse 10, who is the king of glory? Here's the answer. The Lord of hosts. He is the king of glory, Selah. And the word king, more often than not, when we see that, it is a reference to Melech HaMashiach, the word king, Melech. So the king of glory is Messiah. It's going to be him as king that goes through and enters into the kingdom of God. When he passes through those gates, when they open up, when they lift up their head, they acknowledge him. And what he's trying to say here about this verse when it says, oh, oh, lift up your head, oh, gates, it's a term of acknowledgement. The gates, this entrance into the kingdom, they acknowledge God. They acknowledge that King of kings, the Lord of lords, Messiah. And the way that a person enters into the kingdom of God is by acknowledging the same king of glory, the same ruler. And here's what I would say to you. When we look carefully at the word of God, for example, Colossians, we see that it was truly Messiah Yeshua, the son, who created all things and not just creates all things, but all things are held together, maintained by him. And in doing so, we see his sovereignty, we see his power, his authority, and his ability to bring about what this scripture speaks of. He's mighty for war, and what's the outcome of that war? It is a salvation experience. He went to war for you. And where was that war fought? In the holy city of Jerusalem. And in what way? When he went to that cross. When he laid down his life, surrendered everything, 
He was mighty in laying down his life. And it's only when we receive his provision that those gates into the kingdom of God will be open for us. And we will be there and we will see forever and ever this king of glory. Psalm 24, a great psalm that teaches us principles about enjoying a kingdom eternity. While well, close with that, shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.